James Strom Thurmond was an American politician who served for 48 years as a United States Senator from South Carolina. He ran for president in 1948 as the state's rights Democratic Party candidate, receiving 2.4 percent of the popular vote and 39 electoral votes. Thurmond represented South Carolina in the United States Senate from 1954 until 2003, at first as a Democrat and, after 1964, as a Republican. Thurmond switched parties because of his opposition to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, disaffection with the liberalism of the National Party, and his support for the conservatism and opposition to the Civil Rights Bill of the Republican presidential candidate Senator Barry Goldwater. He left office as the only member of either House of Congress to reach the age of 100 while still in office, and as the oldest serving and longest serving senator in U.S. history. Thurmond holds the record as the longest serving member of Congress to serve exclusively in the Senate. He is also the longest serving Republican member of Congress in U.S. history. At 14 years, he was also the longest serving dean of the United States Senate in U.S. history. In opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1957, he conducted the longest filibuster ever by a lone senator, at 24 hours and 18 minutes in length, nonstop. In the 1960s, he opposed the civil rights legislation of 1964 and 1965 to end segregation and enforce the constitutional rights of African American citizens, including suffrage. He always insisted he had never been a racist, but was opposed to excessive federal authority. He attributed the movement to practice constitutional rights to communist agitators. In 1948, Thurmond stated, all the laws of Washington and all the bayonets of the army cannot force the Negro into our homes, into our schools, our churches and our places of recreation and amusement. Starting in the 1970s, he moderated his position on race, but continued to defend his early segregationist campaigns on the basis of states' rights in the context of Southern society at the time. He never fully renounced his earlier viewpoints. Six months after Thurmond died in 2003, his mixed race, grown daughter Essie Mae Washington Williams revealed that he was her father. Her mother Cassie Butler had been 16 years old and working as his family's maid when she became involved with Thurmond, who was 22. Although Thurmond never publicly acknowledged Essie Mae Washington, he paid for her education at a historically black college and passed other money to her for some time. She said that she kept silent out of respect for her father and denied that the two had agreed that she would not reveal her connection to Thermond. His children by his marriage eventually acknowledged her. Her name has been added as one of his children to his memorial at the state capitol. Early life and education, James Strom Thermond was born on December 5, 1902, in Edgeald, South Carolina, the son of Eleanor Gertrude and John William Thermond, a lawyer. His ancestry included English and German. He attended Clemson Agricultural College of South Carolina, where he was a member of the Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity. Thurmond graduated in 1923 with a degree in horticulture. After Thurmond's death in 2003, an attorney for his family confirmed that in 1925, when he was 22, Thurmond fathered a mixed-race daughter, Essie Mae Washington, with his family's housekeeper. Cassie Butler, then 16 years old. Thurmond paid for the girls' college education and provided other support. Essie Mae Washington was raised by her maternal aunt and uncle, and was not told about Thurmond as her father until she was in high school, when she met him for the first time. Early career, after college, Thurmond worked as a farmer, teacher and athletic coach until 1929, when at age 27 he was appointed as Edgeyield County's Superintendent of Education, serving until 1933. Thurmond studied law with his father as a legal apprentice and was admitted to the South Carolina Bar in 1930. He was appointed as the Edgeyield Town and County Attorney, serving from 1930 to 1938. In 1933 Thurmond was elected to the South Carolina Senate represented Edgeyield until he was elected to the 11th Circuit Judgeship. World War II, in 1942, after the U.S. formally entered World War II, Judge Thurmond resigned from the bench to serve in the U.S. Army, rising to Lieutenant Colonel. In the Battle of Normandy, 
he landed in a glider attached to the 82nd Airborne Division. For his military service, he received 18 decorations, medals and awards, including the Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Bronze Star with Valor Device, Purple Heart, World War II Victory Medal, European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal, Belgium's Order of the Crown and France's Croix de Guerre. During 1954 Euro 55 he was president of the Reserve Officers Association. He retired from the U.S. Army Reserves with the rank of Major General. Governor of South Carolina, Thurmond's political career began under Jim Crow laws, established by the start of the 20th century, together with an 1895 constitution that effectively disfranchised blacks from voting, at a time when they constituted the majority of the state's population. White voters in South Carolina strongly resisted early efforts of civil rights activists to regain their ability to vote and to achieve civil rights. Running as a Democrat in the one-party state, Thurmond was elected governor of South Carolina in 1946, largely on the promise of making state government more transparent and accountable by weakening the power of a group of politicians from Barnwell, which Thurmond dubbed the Barnwell Ring, led by House Speaker Solomon Blatt. Many voters considered Thurmond a progressive for much of his term, in large part due to his influence in gaining the arrest of the perpetrators of the lynch mob murder of Willie L. Though none of the men were found guilty by the all-white jury, Thurmond was congratulated by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the American Civil Liberties Union for his efforts to bring the murderers to justice. Run for President In 1948, President Harry S. Truman ordered the end of racial discrimination in the U.S. Army, proposed the creation of a permanent Fair Employment Practices Commission, supported the elimination of state poll taxes, and supported drafting federal anti-lynching laws. In response, Thurmond became a candidate for president on the third-party ticket of the state's rights Democratic Party. It split from the National Democrats over the threat of federal intervention in state affairs regarding segregation and Jim Crow. Thurmond supporters took control of the Democratic Party in the Deep South, and Truman was not included on the presidential ballot. Thurmond carried four states and received 39 electoral votes, but Truman was re-elected. In 1948, Thurmond said the following in a speech, when he was met with cheers by supporters, a listener. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the army to force the southern people to break down segregation and admit the Niagara race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. Early runs for Senate, according to the state constitution, Thurmond was barred from seeking a succeeding second term as governor in 1950, so he mounted a Democratic primary challenge against first-term U.S. Senator Olin Johnston. In the one-party state of the time, the Democratic primary was the only competitive contest. Both candidates denounced President Truman during the campaign. Johnston defeated Thurmond 186,180 votes to 158,904 votes. It was the only statewide election which Thurmond lost. In 1952, Thurmond endorsed Republican Dwight Eisenhower for the presidency, rather than the Democratic nominee Adlai Stevenson. State Democratic Party leaders blocked Thurmond from receiving the nomination to the Senate in 1954, and he ran as a write-in candidate. Senate career, 1950s, the incumbent U.S. Senator, Burnett R. Maybank, was unopposed for re-election in 1954, but he died in September of that year, two months before Election Day. Democratic leaders hurriedly appointed state Senator Edgar A. Brown, a member of the Barnwell Ring, as the party's nominee to replace Maybank. The Brown campaign was managed by future Governor John C. West. In a state where the Democratic nomination was tantamount to election, many criticized the party's failure to elect a candidate by a primary vote. Thurmond announced that he would mount a writing campaign. At the recommendation of Governor James Burns, Thurmond campaigned on the pledge that if he won, he would resign in 1956 to force a primary election which could be contested. Thurmond won overwhelmingly, becoming the first person to be elected to the U.S. Senate as a write-in candidate against ballot-listed opponents. In 1956, Thurmond resigned to run in the party primary, which he won. 
Afterward, he was repeatedly elected to the U.S. Senate by state voters until his retirement 46 years later, despite his mid-career party switch from Democrat to Republican in 1964. Thurmond supported racial segregation throughout much of his career. He wrote the first version of the Southern Manifesto, announcing Southern disagreement with and resistance to implementation of school desegregation following the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education, which ruled that public school segregation was unconstitutional. Many Southern states conducted resistance. In some jurisdictions public schools were closed. In others, whites started private religious schools and enrolled their children in those. In an unsuccessful attempt to derail passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, Thurmond made the longest filibuster ever conducted by a single senator, speaking for a total of 24 hours and 18 minutes. Cots were brought in from a nearby hotel for the legislators to sleep on while Thurmond discussed increasingly irrelevant and obscure topics, including his grandmother's biscuit recipe. Other Southern senators, who had agreed as part of a compromise not to filibuster this bill, were upset with Thurmond because they thought his defiance made them look incompetent to their constituents. According to the journalist Jeff Charlotte in his 2008 book, Thurmond was a member of the family. It has been described by prominent evangelical Christians as one of the most politically well-connected conservative Christian organizations in the U.S. 1960s. Throughout the 1960s, Thurmond generally received relatively low marks from the press and his fellow senators in the performance of his Senate duties, as he often missed votes and rarely proposed or sponsored noteworthy legislation. Thurmond was increasingly at odds with the National Democratic Party. Some of his leaders were supporting the civil rights movement led by African Americans in the South seeking enforcement of their constitutional rights as citizens to suffrage and equal treatment under the law. On September 16, 1964, he switched his party affiliation to the Republican Party. He played an important role in attracting support among white voters in South Carolina for the Republican presidential candidates Barry Goldwater in 1964 and Richard Nixon in 1968. South Carolina and other states of the Deep South had supported the Democrats in every national election from the end of Reconstruction, when white Democrats re-established political control in the South, to 1960. However, discontent with the National Democrats' increasing support for civil rights resulted in John F. Kennedy's barely winning the state in 1960. Adlai Stevenson had narrowly won the state in 1952 by only 5,000 votes, receiving 50.72% of the vote compared to 49.28% for Dwight D. Eisenhower. In comparison, in 1948, the GOP candidate for president, Thomas Dewey, had received just 3.78% of the vote. After the assassination of President Kennedy, President Lyndon B. Johnson's campaign for passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 angered white segregationist Democrats. These laws ended segregation and committed the federal government to enforce voting rights of citizens by the supervision of elections in states in which the pattern of voting showed that blacks had been disfranchised. Many in the Democratic Party strongly opposed these laws, including Senator Robert Byrd, who filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for 14 hours and 13 minutes on June 9 and 10, 1964. Goldwater won South Carolina by a large margin in 1964. In 1966, former Governor Ernest Fritz Hollings won South Carolina's other Senate seat in a special election. He and Thurmond served together for just over 36 years, making them the longest-serving Senate duo in American history. Thurmond and Hollings had a very good relationship, despite their often stark philosophical differences. Their long tenure meant that their seniority in the Senate gave South Carolina a good measure of clout in national politics, despite its modest population. At the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami Beach, Florida, Thurmond, along with Mississippi State Chairman Clark Reed, former U.S. Representative and gubernatorial nominee Howard Calloway of Georgia, and Charlton Leon of Louisiana held the Deep South state solidly for Richard M. Nixon despite the sudden last-minute entry of Governor Ronald Reagan of California into the race. 
Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York was also in the race but having little effect. In the fall 1968 general election, he won South Carolina with 38% of the popular vote and gained South Carolina's electoral votes. With the then segregationist Democrat George Wallace on the ballot, the South Carolina Democratic voters split almost evenly between the Democratic Party nominee, Hubert Humphrey, who received 29.6% of the total vote, and Wallace, who received 32.3%. Other Deep South states swung to Wallace and posted weak totals for Nixon. Thurmond had quieted conservative fears over rumors that Nixon planned to ask either liberal Charles Percy or Mark Hatfield to be his running mate. He informed Nixon that both men were unacceptable to the South for the vice presidency. Nixon ultimately asked Governor Spiro Agnew from Maryland a Euro an acceptable choice to Thurmond a Euro to join the ticket. At this time, Thurmond led the effort to thwart Johnson's attempt to elevate Justice Abe Fortas to the post of Chief Justice of the United States. Thurmond's conservative position left him unhappy with the decisions of the Warren Court. He was glad to disappoint Johnson and enable the presidential successor Richard Nixon to make the appointment for Warren's vacancy. Thurmond decried the Supreme Court opinion in Alexander v. Holmes County Board of Education which ordered the immediate desegregation of schools in the American South. This had followed continued Southern resistance for more than a decade to desegregation following the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board of Education that segregation of public schools was unconstitutional. Thurmond praised President Nixon and his Southern strategy of delaying desegregation, saying Nixon stood with the South in this case. 1970s Thanks to his close relationship with the Nixon administration, Thurmond was able to deliver a great deal of federal money, appointments and projects to his state. With a like-minded president in the White House, Thurmond became a very effective power broker in Washington. His staffers said that his goal was to be South Carolina's indispensable man in Washington, D.C. In the 1970 gubernatorial election, Thurmond's preferred candidate, Conservative U.S. Representative Albert W. Watson, was defeated by the more moderate opponent, Democrat John C. West, who had opposed Thurmond's initial write-in election to the Senate and the then outgoing lieutenant governor. Watson had defected to the GOP in 1965, the year after Thurmond's own bolt, and had been politically close to the senator. Watson's defeat caused Thurmond slowly to moderate his own image in regard to changing race relations. In 1970, Thurmond urged Nixon to nominate another South Carolina Republican convert, Joseph O. Rogers, Jr., to a federal judgeship. He had been the party's unsuccessful 1966 gubernatorial nominee against the Democrat Robert Evander McNair. At the time Rogers was the U.S. attorney in South Carolina. When his judicial nomination dragged on, Rogers resigned as U.S. attorney and withdrew from consideration. He blamed the Nixon administration, which he and Thurmond had helped to bring to power, for failure to advance his nomination in the Senate because of opposition to the appointment from the NAACP. On February 4, 1972, Thurmond sent a secret memo to William Timmons and United States Attorney General John N. Mitchell, with an attached file from the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee urging that British musician John Lennon be deported from the United States as an undesirable alien, due to Lennon's political views and activism. The document claimed that Lennon's influence on young people could affect Nixon's chances of re-election, and suggested that terminating Lennon's visa might be a strategy countermeasure. Thurmond's memo and attachment, received by the White House on February 7, 1972, initiated the Nixon administration's persecution of John Lennon that threatened the former Beatle with deportation for nearly five years from 1972 to 1976. The documents were discovered in the FBI files after a Freedom of Information Act search by Professor John Wiener, and published in Wiener's book Gimme Some Truth, the John Lennon FBI files. They are discussed in the documentary film, The U.S. vs. John Lennon. During this period, the NSA reportedly had been eavesdropping on Thurmond's conversations, using the British part of the Echelon project. In 1976, 
Thurmond appeared in a campaign commercial for incumbent U.S. President Gerald Ford in his race against Thurmond's fellow Southerner, former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. In the commercial, Thurmond declared that Ford's sound, ed more like a Southerner than Jimmy Carter. Post-1970 views regarding race, in 1970, blacks still constituted some 30 percent of South Carolina's population. In 1900, they had constituted 58.4 percent of the state's population. Thousands of blacks left the state during the first half of the 20th century in the Great Migration to escape the Jim Crow laws and seek opportunities in the industrial cities of the North and Midwest. After the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was implemented, African Americans were legally protected in exercising their constitutional rights as United States citizens to register to vote in South Carolina without harassment or discrimination. State politicians could no longer ignore this voting bloc, who were allied with increasing numbers of white residents who supported civil rights. Thurmond appointed Thomas Moss, an African American, to his Senate staff in 1971. It has been described as the first such appointment by a member of the South Carolinian congressional delegation. In 1983, he supported legislation to make the birthday of Martin Luther King, J.R. a federal holiday. In South Carolina, the honor was diluted. Until 2000 the state offered employees the option to celebrate this holiday or substitute one of three Confederate holidays instead. Thurmond never explicitly renounced his earlier views on racial segregation. Later career Thurmond became president pro tempore of the U.S. Senate in 1981, and held the largely ceremonial post for three terms, alternating with his longtime rival Robert Byrd, depending on the party composition of the Senate. During this period, he maintained a close relationship with the Reagan White House. Thurmond served as the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee during the hearings on the nomination of Clarence Thomas to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1991 and worked closely with Joe Biden, then the chairman. He joined the minority of Republicans who voted for the Brady Bill for gun control in 1993. On December 5, 1996, Thurmond became the oldest serving member of the U.S. Senate, and on May 25, 1997, the longest-serving member, casting his 15,000th vote in September 1998. In the following month, when astronaut John Glenn was to embark on the discovery at age 77, Thurmond, who was his senior by 19 years, reportedly sent him a message saying, I want to go too. Toward the end of Thurmond's Senate career, critics suggested that his mental abilities had declined. His supporters argued that, while he lacked physical stamina due to his age, mentally he remained aware and attentive, and maintained a very active work schedule, showing up for every floor vote. He stepped down as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee at the beginning of 1999, as he had pledged to do in late 1997. Declining to seek re-election in 2002, he was succeeded by fellow Republican Lindsey Graham. Thurmond left the Senate in January 2003 as the United States' longest-serving senator. In his November farewell speech in the Senate, Thurmond told his colleagues I love all of you, especially your wives, the latter being a reference to his flirtatious nature with younger women. At his 100th birthday and retirement celebration in December, Thurmond said, I don't know how to thank you. You're wonderful people, I appreciate you appreciate what you've done for me, and may God allow you to live a long time. Thurmond's 100th birthday celebration generated controversy because of remarks by Mississippi Senator Trent Lott that were considered as racially insensitive. When Strom Thurmond ran for president, Mississippi voted for him. We're proud of it. And if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all these problems over the years either. Lott was ousted as Senate Majority Leader. Personal life, marriages, and children. Thurmond married his first wife, Jean Crouch, in the South Carolina governor's mansion on November 7, 1947. In April 1947, when Crouch was a senior at Winthrop College, Thurmond was a judge in a beauty contest in which she was selected as Miss South Carolina. In June, upon her graduation, Thurmond hired her as his personal secretary. 
On September 13, 1947, Thermond proposed marriage by calling Crouch to his office to take a dictated letter. The letter was to her, and contained his proposal of marriage. Thirteen years later in 1960, Crouch died of a brain tumor at age 33. They had no children. Thermond married his second wife, Nancy Janice Moore, on December 22, 1968. He was 66 years old and she was 22. She had won Miss South Carolina in 1965. Two years later, he hired her to work in his Senate office. They separated in 1991, but never divorced. At age 68 in 1971, Thermon fathered the first of four children with his second wife, Nancy, who was then 25. The names of the children are, Nancy Moore Thermond, a beauty pageant contestant who was killed by a drunk driver. James Strom Thermond, Jr., who became U.S. Attorney for the District of South Carolina and is the current South Carolina Second Judicial Circuit Solicitor. Juliana Gertrude Whitmer, who works for the American Red Cross in Washington, D.C. And Paul Reynolds Thermond, who was elected as South Carolina State Senator representing District 41. First daughter, six months after Thermond's death, Essie May Washington Williams publicly revealed that she was his daughter. She identified as African American, was married and had a family. She was a retired Los Angeles Unified School District elementary school teacher with a master's degree. She was born on October 12, 1925, to Carrie Tunch Butler, who had worked for Thermond's parents and was 16 years old when Thermond, then 22, impregnated her. Though Thermond never publicly acknowledged Washington Williams while he was alive, he helped pay her way through a historically black college in South Carolina and continued to give her financial support well into her adult life. Washington Williams said that she did not reveal she was Thermond's daughter during his lifetime because it wasn't to the advantage of either one of us. She kept silent out of respect for her father and denied that the two had agreed that she would not reveal her connection to him. After Washington Williams came forward, the Thermond family publicly acknowledged her parentage. Her name has been added to that of his other children on a monument to Thermond installed at the State House grounds. Many close friends, staff members, and South Carolina residents had long suspected that Washington Williams was Thermond's daughter, as they had noted his interest in her. The young woman had been granted a degree of access to Thermond more typical of a family member than to a member of the public. Washington Williams later joined the Daughters of the American Revolution and the United Daughters of the Confederacy, as she was eligible through her Thermond ancestry. Thermond was a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, a similar group for men. She encouraged other African Americans to learn their ancestry and join the lineage associations, to promote a wider sense of American history, including its long history of interracial families. Washington Williams died on February 4, 2013, in Columbia, South Carolina, at age 87. Death, Thermon died in his sleep on June 26, 2003, at 9.45 p.m. of heart failure at a hospital in Edgefield, South Carolina. He was 100 years old. After lying in state in the rotunda of the State House in Columbia, his body was carried by a Kesson to the First Baptist Church for services where then Senator Joe Biden delivered a eulogy, and later to the family burial plot in Willowbrook Cemetery in Edgefield, where he was interred. Political Timeline, Governor of South Carolina, States Rights Democratic Presidential Candidate, eight-term Senator from South Carolina, Democrat, Republican, President pro tempore, set record for the longest one-man congressional filibuster, set record for oldest serving member at 94 years set the then record for longest cumulative tenure in the Senate at 43 years, increasing to 47 years, six months at his retirement in January 2003, surpassed by Robert Byrd in July 2006, became the only senator ever to serve at the age of 100. Electoral History Legacy The Strom Thurmond Foundation, Inc. provides financial aid support to deserving South Carolina residents who demonstrate financial need. The foundation was established in 1974 by Thurmond with honoraria received from speeches, 
donations from friends and family, and from other acts of generosity. It serves as a permanent testimony to his memory, and to his concern for the education of able students who have demonstrated financial need. A reservoir on the Georgia Euro South Carolina border is named after him, Lake Strom Thurmond. The University of South Carolina is home to the Strom Thurmond Fitness Center, one of the largest fitness complexes on a college campus. The new complex has largely replaced the Blatt Fitness Center, named for Solomon Blatt, a political rival of Thurmond. Charleston Southern University has a Strom Thurmond building, which houses the school's business offices, bookstore, and post office. Thurmond Building at Winthrop University is named for him. He served on Winthrop's Board of Trustees from 1936 to 1938 and again from 1947 to 1951 when he was Governor of South Carolina. A statue of Strom Thurmond is located on the grounds of the South Carolina State Capitol as a memorial to his service to the state. Strom Thurmond High School is located in his hometown of Edgeald, South Carolina. Al Sharpton was reported on February 24, 2007, to be a descendant of slaves owned by the Thurmond family. Sharpton has not asked for a DNA test. The U.S. Air Force has a C-17 Globmaster named the Spirit of Strom Thurmond. In 1989 he was presented with the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Ronald Reagan. In 1993 he was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George H. W. Bush. The Strom Thurmond Institute is located on the campus of Clemson University. Appears in the 2008 award-winning documentary on Lee Atwater, Boogeyman, The Lee Atwater Story. Notes. Further reading, Crispino. Joseph. Strom Thurmond's America 404 pages. $30. A biography focused on role as pioneer Sunbelt conservative. Finley. Keith M. Delaying the Dream, Southern Senators and the Fight Against Civil Rights, 1938 to Euro 1965. The Dixiecrat Revolt and the End of the Solid South, 1932 to Euro 1968 by Kari Fredrickson, University of North Carolina Press. ISBN 0-8078-4910-3. Olstrom, an unauthorized biography of Strom Thurmond by Jack Bass. Marilyn Walser Thompson, University of South Carolina Press. ISBN 1-57003-514-8. Strom, The Complicated Personal and Political Life of Strom Thurmond by Jack Bass and Marilyn Walser Thompson, Public Affairs 2005. ISBN 1-58648-297-1. Strom Thurmond and the Politics of Southern Change by Nadine Coordes, Mercer University Press. ISBN 0-86554-446-8. Pierre Trusser, David 1948, Harry Truman's Improbable Victory in the Year That Changed America, Union Square Press, 2011. Primary Sources, The Faith We Have Not Kept, by Strom Thurmond, Viewpoint Books. 1968. Dear Senator, a memoir by the daughter of Strom Thurmond by S. E. May Washington Williams, William Stadium, Reagan Books. ISBN 0-06-076095-8. External links. Strom Thurmond Institute at Clemson University, U.S. Senate Historical Page on Strom Thurmond, Sciway Biography of Strom Thurmond, NGA Biography of Strom Thurmond, Oral History Interview with Strom Thurmond from Oral Histories of the American South, Strom Thurmond Foundation, Inc. Remarks at the Presentation Ceremony for the Presidential Citizens Medal a Euro January 18, 1989, Booknotes Interview with Nadine Coordas on Strom Thurmond and the Politics of Southern Change, April 4, 1993. Complete transcript and audio and video of Senator Joe Biden's eulogy for Strom Thurmond, Articles, Strom Thurmond's Family Confirms Paternity Claim, by David Mattingly, CNN.com, December 15, 2003, Biography at the Biographical Directory of the United States Congress, The Scarred Stone, The Strom Thurmond Monument by Joseph Crispino, Emory University, 
April 29, 2010. Obituaries, tribute to Strom Thurmond from the Statio Euro June 26, 2003, Strom Thurmond dead at 100 at the Wayback Machine, CNN, June 26, 2003, Strom Thurmond dead at 100. By James D. Liberto Jr., Fox News, June 26, 2003, Strom Thurmond. Find a grave. Retrieved August 4, 2008 A.